turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Uh, it may not seem like a very may seem like a very unlikely passage to uh, get into on Mother's Day because it is talking about a couple mothers, uh, but it's kind of a sordid kind of uh, situation. And one of the awesome things there's millions of awesome things about the Bible, but one of the awesome things is God doesn't cover up the warts. You know, you see these sacred books of these various religions, and everybody, you know, certain people are made to look so heroic and. And they become beyond human, and you think of, uh, you know, all the superpowers and everything else that's attributed to, like, the Greek gods and so forth. And the interesting thing about the Scripture is God is God, and people are people, and you see that people fall short. And this text is about two prostitutes who are arguing about whose baby it belongs to who, and which baby died, and which one uh, was alive. And it may, as I said, seem like an unlikely passage to share on a Mother's Day, but I think it's very appropriate because I think there's some lessons here uh, for mothers and, and really for all of us. So 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. Let's, let's read the passage together. If you don't have a Bible, there may be one uh, in front of you. 1 Kings is, uh, if you go to the first book of the Bible and you hang a right and go, you know, 10, 12 books to your right, you'll run into First and Second Kings. 1 Kings three sixteen. Then two women who were harlots came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, O oh my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. It happened on the third day after I gave birth that this woman who gave birth to a child and we were together, there was no stranger with us in the house, only the two of us in the house. This woman's son died in the night because she lay on it. So she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while her maidservant, while your maidservant slept and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead son in my bosom. When I arose in the morning to nurse my son, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him carefully in the morning, behold, he was not my son whom I had born. Then the other woman said, No, for the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. But the first woman said, No, for the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, The one says, This is my son who is living, and your son is dead. the dead one. The other says, No, for your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. The king said, Get me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. The king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Then the woman whose child was the living one spoke to the king, for she was deeply stirred over her son, and said, Oh, my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill him. But the one said, He shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. Then the king said, Give the first woman the child, the living child, and by no means kill him. She is the mother. When all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had handed down, they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. You know, this, this, this uh, occurrence, this event in Solomon's young life as king uh, serves uh, usually to illustrate the wisdom that God had given Solomon. And usually when this text is read, the emphasis is on how God imparted incredible wisdom to King Solomon. And, and that's primarily the reason this text is given. This story is recorded for us in Holy Scripture. However, there's obviously deeper things going on and there's deeper lessons we can learn from this text. But I think it's interesting because King Solomon was asked to request whatever from the Lord. Anything in God's will he would have received. And he asked God for wisdom that he might serve as a wise king to please God. And God was pleased, the Lord God was incredibly pleased with Solomon's uh, request. And because he didn't request, you know, riches and gold and power and what have you, the scriptures say that God was pleased with his request, and he made him the wisest man on earth. In fact, the scriptures tell us that, that dignitaries, uh, people of great prestige, uh, visited him from far lands and what have you to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And the first point I want, point I want to make is, for mothers, and really for all of us, but specifically for mothers on Mother's Day, is we've got an incredible uh, lesson here on how to get wisdom and how we need the king's wisdom. And Solomon, that was very wise because, you see, they didn't have 
uh, you know, forensics in those days. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have fingerprints. He couldn't go and look at, you know, dental records. The kids obviously were too young for dental records, but there were no fingerprints. They couldn't uh, look at DNA, you know, do, do a DNA study to see which was the true mother. They were stuck. It seemed like there was no way, way out. You had two women who were desperately claiming this was their child, and there was no way really to find out, of course, until Solomon requested a sword and was going to divide the child down the middle. Obviously, this was merely a ploy to garner or uh, draw out the woman's emotion or evoke emotion from the real mother, which it did come out. She was incredibly stirred and became emotional and said, no, give the, give the child to the other mother. Of course, the other mother could care less really about the child. She just wanted someone else's possession. She felt envy. She was probably incredibly distraught losing her child. And, and she, the enemy put a thought in her mind or what have you that she could still have a child as though hers wasn't gone. And, and of course, the thoughts that were elicited from her during that were uh, the thoughts of disdain. If I can't have a child, then you can't have one either. Went from wanting and coveting to, you know, envying uh, to malice and what have you. And wow, what a powerful story that is to illustrate the wisdom of Solomon. And I believe... Uh, you know, since there were no birth certificates and fingerprints and forensics, DNA studies, uh, there was no really no way to really find out, uh, barring a voice from heaven or something dramatic like that which had happened. But I want to point out to you is that mothers need the king's wisdom. Uh, mothers make, mothers are absolutely gifted in ways like nobody else. First of all, men and women are different. Contrary to the so-called uh, uh, popular politics of the progressives, you know, who, but we're very different. I mean, anybody who has, can think and look at each other, you know, physiologically, we're far different. Uh, men aren't mer meant to carry children and be mothers. They can't breastfeed. They can't bear children. They're physiologically way different than women. Women are gifted to bring forth life into the world. And you know what? Studies have shown that women aren't just different with regard to being able to give birth and, and physiologically uh, different with an, an effeminate type structure to bring forth life, but uh, studies have shown dramatically that a woman's brain is far different than a man's brain. I mean, they're made, they're just, they're different. So they're not just different physiologically on the, you know, with regard to the body, but they're different. Men and women are very different. How many of you could tell that men and women are different, even the way they think, you know? And sometimes I like to illustrate that by saying if there was a Super Bowl on and all the guys are hovered around the TV, you know, and, and it's a close game and they're just like, they can't, and they're excited. And a woman comes in with a new baby that's just been born, you know, do all the guys go over and say, Check out the baby. Let me hold your baby. No. You know, they want to see this. You know, they might say, oh, check out the babies here. And they'll go look at it in a few minutes after, you know, this next pass or what have you, or after this uh, red zone stand or whatever, your goal line stand even. But the women are over there, and they're all excited about the baby, and they want to hold the baby, or they want to see the baby, and they're ooing and aahing and cooing, and, and the guys are screaming when the, you know, depending on the reaction or what team they're for. And you know what's amazing? I, and I think about, okay, now, which is really more important to the Lord, though, you know? A football or a baby, you know? So I think women are smarter in a lot of ways than guys. I really do. I think guys are smarter than women in other ways, so I think it kind of evens it out. Because we're all made in the image of God, amen, to complement one another. And uh, God has made us that way. And Satan would love to erase a distinction between man and woman because he wants to confuse the sexes. He wants to confuse the purposes of marriage and human anatomy and male and female. And studies have shown that the best parenting that goes on, the best chances a child has at growing up in, in a healthy environment and being successful is a mom and a dad, one man, one woman relationship. And Satan wants to destroy that because he hates everything that's from God. He wants to destroy you know, this, you know, all of us. So he wants to erase these things. So it's important that we champion motherhood. You know, I was going to do a message called The High Calling of Motherhood this Sunday, today. I decided I've been praying about it. I'm going to save that one for another time. And I wanted to go through this text because there's some beautiful truths in this text that I think uh, can really open up our hearts. And, and so one thing we see is wisdom, is wisdom. We all need wisdom. 
you see. And mothers, your children, you, mothers make thousands of decisions throughout a child's lifetime, important decisions. Mothers face, uh, children these days, speci- uh, every child has certain special needs. We live in a dark and fallen world, you know, where things get really tough. And, and mothers need to be there and they need to uh, realize that God is there to give them wisdom when they seek his face, just like Solomon was gracious to this prostitute, how much more will he be gracious to you who are seeking his face? I'm talking about not Solomon, but another. Because you see, the scriptures say, Jesus talked about the woman, uh, the queen of the south, who came such a distance to hear the wisdom of Solomon, but he said, behold, one greater than Solomon is here. See, Solomon, like so many others in the Old Testament, was a type, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, one greater than Solomon is here. And that was really to chasten the leaders of Israel, that the queen of the south traveled all that distance to hear Solomon's wisdom. But behold, one greater than Solomon's here, and you aren't paying attention. We need to pay attention to the one that's greater than Solomon and go to him for wisdom, amen? We need to seek him out because our children do have great needs. I mean, if you remember, if you are a little bit older, unless you're really, really young, you may have forgotten, but do you remember those times when you needed mommy, you know? Remember when you were really scared or in need? And I mean, throughout our lives when we were very young, I mean, mommy's, I mean, everything, you know, along with daddy, but she plays a very significant role. And it reminds me of a little boy who uh, was during a thunderstorm, a, a violent thunderstorm on a summer night, unexpected, and the house was shaking, and, and Mommy was tucking him in to his bed and, and uh, saying goodnight to him and everything, and he was trying to be a brave little boy, and, and she went to turn off the light, and his voice was charming. He said, Mommy, Mommy, he, he said, can you please sleep with me tonight? You know, he was so scared. He wanted her, she wanted, he wanted her to lay down next to him. And, and she said, Honey, she goes, I can't. You know, I need to sleep with your daddy tonight. And it was silent for a few seconds. And then he said, that big sissy, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes kids don't understand their needs or they don't understand the bigger picture. And they have a limited understanding. And everything seems like it's going to come down. And mommy is God's instrument in bringing comfort, bringing peace, bringing answers, you know, uh, the hand of God so often in the child's life. In fact, when God had made the first man, Adam, and then he had made Eve, it says that she was a helpmate. That Hebrew word, as I pointed out before, that Hebrew word is translated throughout the Old Testament sometimes as shield, and it's used of God. And I love that because I, it's one of my, I love to look at the Hebrew and Greek words because sometimes there's different translations of those words, you see, different meanings and nuances. And, and that's one that for the last so many years when I was looking at that Hebrew word in the Old Testament and, and, and ch- chased the cognates down, the relatives to that word, and found that that very word is co- translated shield. But that not that awesome? That women are shields. And not even just mothers. If they're not mothers, prior to being mothers, they're still shields for the Lord, you know? And, and shields of their households. They shield their children. They, they can help shield the relationship. Even when Abraham had uh, allowed his wife to be taken into captivity by Pharaoh, you know, it says that, that the household was blessed for, for Sarah's sake because of her obedience, because of her bravery. And First Peter says 3 says she didn't fear, but she trusted the Lord, you see. And uh, there's awesome women of God who show bravery to follow, follow the Lord when it's not popular, even sometimes when men have backed down. Think of Deborah. Remember that? In, in the book of Judges, chapter 5, she stood up and took a stand when even the king uh, was scared to fight. So women, mothers are incredible. There's so many stories of the bravery of mothers. But mothers need the wisdom of the king. And just as this prostitute, these two prostitutes, went to King Solomon So mothers can go to King Jesus because the greater than Solomon 
has come. And he said, the one who is greater than Solomon is here. And guess what? He's still here with us spiritually. Jesus said that where two or three are gathered together in his name, there is in the midst of them. Jesus also said that, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen? So you have the king that you can go to for wisdom. You have the king that you can go to for everything. Right now, we're facing hard times. Right now, the economy is taking it is is really taking a downward spiral here in our country, and people are suffering in different ways. Not typically anywhere in comparison to how people have suffered for years in the third world countries, but things can get worse, and things are very bad for uh, certain people are suffering in that way, homeless and what have you. And but uh, things are pretty bad, and we need the king's wisdom. But Jesus said in chapter six. Verse 33 of Matthew, he said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be what? Added to you. All these things will be added to you. See, Solomon had great wisdom, but guess what? Jesus, right? He's the one that gave Solomon the wisdom. He's the one that gave Solomon the wisdom. In fact, the scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, it's by his doing that we are in Christ Jesus, who has become to us the wisdom of God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus is our wisdom, amen? You know, he's the word of God. The word means message. He's God's word or message made flesh, you see. In fact, in Colossians 2, 3, I love that passage. It talks about how in him, in Christ it's talking about Jesus is stored all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We need wisdom. We need knowledge. And you're not going to get the wisdom and knowledge that you can get from God's word, from the Lord Jesus Christ, in any institution, any secular institution. The best universities will not lead you to spiritual truth. And to give you the most important answers, they're found only in the Lord. In fact, the Bible says in the last days, Terrible times would come, and it says that people would be ever learning, yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And it just blows me away. You see people with vast amounts of knowledge, you know. They might do really, really well on Jeopardy or one of these game shows, but you know what? When it comes down to spiritual truth, they're infants. They don't have a clue about heaven and hell, good and evil, Christ and Satan, eternity, the things that matter most. And it's very heartbreaking when you really think about it. It really is very heartbreaking. Very, very heartbreaking. It, we have such a blessing because in him is stored all the treasures of knowledge and wisdom. Amen? He has become to us the wisdom of God. Amen? And if you lack wisdom, it says in James chapter 1, verse 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to everyone generously and without reproach. Ask and it will be given him. He won't reproach you if you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need wisdom. I'm not going to say, get out of here. I don't have time for you. It says, if you ask for wisdom, he gives to everyone generously who asks, without reproach, without condemning them. And it says, he answers. So we need to seek him for wisdom. You see, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it's one of the most important passages in the book of Proverbs. And it's, it's very beautiful because it says, lean not on your own, what? Understanding, right? Lean not on your own understanding. Why? Because our own understanding is so limited. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, the same book, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. So we're not supposed to lean on our own understanding. And it says we're supposed to what? Trust the Lord. That verse starts out by saying, Trust the Lord with all your heart. You see, Solomon was an earthly king who fell short. With all of his wisdom, he became foolish because he didn't walk in it. That's kind of interesting. We think the wisest guy in the world became very foolish for a time until he came back to God. The strongest man ever on earth, Samson, in a way was the weakest man. And the thing is, is you need to avail yourself of the wisdom. Samson needed to avail himself of the power of spirit for strength. We have wisdom offered to us. We have the capability to be the wisest people on earth. However, if we don't avail ourselves of God's wisdom, and we don't ask him for it, and we don't seek him in prayer, we can end up being foolish and making foolish decisions. 
So it's really important that we realize and obey Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your what? Paths straight. Do you do that? In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Seek for His glory. Seek for His will. That's what we're called to do. If we call ourselves believers, Christians, that's the way we ought to be living our lives. And He'll make our paths straight. How? He's given us His word. This is the gift from heaven, man. God's love letter, his wisdom to us, his knowledge to us. Psalm 119, 105, which is all about the word of God. It's such a powerful, longest chapter in all of the Bible. But Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So we have light in the dark. We live in a dark world that's getting darker. So we need to avail ourselves of God's holy wisdom. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's how we're called to live. Physically, we need to live off of bread. We need food. But spiritually, we need to live off of God's word. That's food for our souls. That's the milk and the meat and the, and the, and the bread of spiritual life, the word of God. Jesus said his word is alive and and the scriptures say he talked about that he himself talked about the words i speak to you are our spirit he said and hebrews chapter 4 says that his word is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword able to divide bone and marrow and soul and spirit man what a gift we have in his word why would we neglect it and i give you solomon as an example who ended up living a foolish life for some time until he came back to the lord because he did not avail himself to apply god's knowledge and walk wisely. Or Samson, who was the strongest guy to ever have lived on earth, with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, if he exerted all his power. Who, but I'm talking about strictly man and not at all God. And he was the weakest at times, and he failed miserably. And I believe that's a picture in two different directions that we can go as believers. We could be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We could be wise with his wisdom, but we need to seek him out. That's why we're called, the word of God says, you have not because you ask not. And it would be very sad to me if there was mothers in this assembly, because I know there are several throughout the church around the world who have not because they ask not. You need wisdom. You need to cry out to God when it comes to training up your children in the way they should go. Amen. You need to constantly, every day, that should be your prayer. God, give me wisdom. Give me guidance. Constantly go to the king. And that goes for husbands as well. It goes for dads as well. And we're called to pray. A lot of times, it, it breaks my heart when, when Christians sit around and worry, and they don't realize that God tells us that worry is a sin. We need to be praying. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, Be anxious or don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And it says, and the peace of God that passes, that surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you are casting your cares on the Lord and crying out to Him, and not just, well, I don't want to bother about God about this or that. No, He says, be anxious for nothing, zero, nada, but in everything, let your prayers and requests or be known, made known to God in everything. In everything, with prayers and supplications and thanksgiving, let your prayers or your requests be made known to God. And the awesome fruit of that is he'll guard your hearts, your minds, in the peace that is in Christ Jesus. Because the Bible says, he that keeps his eyes in the book of Isaiah fixed on the Lord is kept in perfect peace. Amen. And that's where we need to be right now. I mean, things are going to get worse and uglier uh, in this world that we live in. Jesus said they would get worse. Lawlessness would increase. Thus saith Jesus. Okay? Love would grow cold. Thus saith the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is. So we need to make sure that our eyes are fixed on our Lord, who is the wisest of all. In fact, the scriptures say, he came to his own, his own didn't receive him. And the scriptures say, even though he made the world, the world did not receive him. He's the maker of the universe. 
He made the molecules. He made the atoms. He, he made the entire universe. He made you. He's pretty wise, isn't he? <laughs> Why would we not seek him? And he's so willing to help us. Even as King Solomon, who had less wisdom and less compassion than Jesus, was willing to help a prostitute, how much more would the Lord Jesus Christ help you? Now, so the first lesson, avail yourself of God's wisdom. Avail, pray and seek him. Because as you pray and seek him, you'll be far wiser three months, a year, two years from now about life and how to live life than if you don't. The second lesson I want to talk about is a mother's love. Is a mother's love. Mothers blow me away. I mean, more than any buddy on earth, I just trip out on how mothers have this intrinsic love for a child that is so conscientious and so deep. You know, and I'm not demeaning and saying fathers are less because I do believe a, a father's love is, is very deep and powerful, but they manifest sometimes in different ways. Because I know, I know three in the morning, you know, and my wife sleeps like a rock, okay? And she sleeps like, I mean, because she's pretty animated, it seems like, all day long. And then when she's out, she's out, you know. And, uh, but you know what? Three in the morning can come with each of the babies, and they could, there could be a little peep that I don't even hear. And all of a sudden, she's getting up, and she's going, and she's going and checking on the, on, and, and it's time to feed the baby, you know, the new baby. So I thought, wow, that's just a trip, man, because it feels like gravity is like turned up a thousand times sometimes at those moments. You couldn't even move, you know, and she's up. Now, dads are programmed differently. And, I mean, today I was up with my 308. I, I had my rifle cocked, and I was, you know, going downstairs with it. And she goes, don't shoot the dog, you know, because we heard a, our sliding glass window, boom, open up. And I jumped up, because I'm a guy, and I looked in all three of the rooms really quickly with my children and saw them all sleeping there. And I was feeling bad for whoever was downstairs, because it was, you know, and I was like, God, help me, you know, just shoot the guy in the knees, you know. <laughs> because I don't want to kill someone, but, uh, and I know that might be foolish, but I was like, okay, Lord, and my wife's like, don't shoot the dog, and, and I, and, man, I can, I didn't realize how fast I can lock and load, man, it's boom, boom, and then, <laughs> in my underwear, you know, and don't want to see, it. not a good sight, you know, could have scared the guy to death, you know, but, uh, and then I'm looking around, man, and the one good sign was my little dog, who would yaps like crazy when there's the slightest sound outside, was like, fine. So I was, you know. And then what we realized is that, Heather, I went upstairs and we asked the kids, and, you know, did anybody shut it? And Heather said, yeah, I just shut my window because it was getting hot. Because this is like, I don't know, it's probably like 6 o'clock or something, I don't know. And praise God, it was her window, but we both thought it was downstairs. Now we know her window sounds like it's downstairs. So anyway, uh, but we're made differently, you see. You see, she's not the one. She wouldn't have been, you know, in her underwear with a 308 going around, you know. So God has made us differently because we compliment one another. Somebody needs to breastfeed, that's not me, okay? And somebody else needs to guard the house, you know. So the crazy thing is, when you think about it, is God has blessed us and commented, but a mother's love is just amazing. It really is. I mean, the closest thing I've seen on this earth to an angel is a mother, really personally, my own mother. I mean, I just, what an outpouring of love I've seen in the kids in my family have seen all their lives from an incredible mother. And, and I know there's incredible mothers all over in this fellowship. And those of you who aren't mothers who are women, you have motherly instincts that God has given you that have manifested in various ways that have borne all kinds of motherly type of fruit. But it's important for us to understand, important for us to uh, get that that our mothers have sacrificed a lot. When I think of sacrificial living, a lot of what you can think about is mothers. They carry the child for nine months. They protect that child and, and feed that child and care for that child before the child's even born for nine months. And that's not easy, okay? I've, I haven't gone through it. I can't empathize, but I can sympathize from seeing my wife go through it a few different times. And that's a lot of work in and of itself. But then they keep on giving. They keep on sacrificing after their children are born. 
and they, they help them meet goals, and they, they teach them, and they train them, and they're there through the sweat of their brow, so to speak. And it's indeed an incredible, uh, incredible blessing. Now, it's interesting because you say, yeah, but you know what? That's not my mother, Joe. You know, because my mother gave me up for adoption. My mother, uh, you know, she, she didn't, she wasn't there. And, you know, I don't even want to think about Mother's Day. I have a hard time Mother's Day because my mom abandoned me and what have you. But you know what? Your mother cared enough to carry you for nine months. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. And it's interesting because when we look at this story and we look at what happened with these two prostitutes, they didn't seem like the motherly type at all, right? But you know what? This mother was willing to give up her child. You remember that? When the, when the king brought out the sword, when he was going to slice the child in two, she was quick to give it up because she thought that that would be best for the child at that point. I'm not saying that mothers that give up their baby for adoption always are doing what they think is best, but oftentimes there's more to the story. There's a lot more to the story sometimes. In fact, I think of the mother and the kid were in the mall, and, and the little child said, Mommy, let's race, you know. And really little girl, and Mommy said, Okay, we'll race over there to, you know, uh, such and such a place. And they began to race, and she let the little child get a lead, and the child had a good lead and kept looking back, but Mommy started catching up a little bit to make it interesting. And all of a sudden the child just got hysterical and started screaming, my mommy's going to beat me. She's going to beat me. And everybody's looking at the mother like she's a child killer, you know. And sometimes you don't see the whole picture. You just see a couple people running, and you think that someone is real horrible. But sometimes when you see a bigger part of the picture, you start to realize there's more to the story, more to the picture than meets the eye. And sometimes there's good intentions. Sometimes there's grand intentions. And if this other mother had grown up, this other prostitute with the baby, she found out the other mother was a real baby, that baby could be really upset getting older. So I can't believe my mom did that, not knowing that that was the only way in the mother's mind at the time to save that child's life. So sometimes when it comes to our mother's decisions, not just those types of decisions throughout their lives, sometimes we don't realize that sometimes they're doing what they think is best, often. So we need to give mothers a break for a few reasons. But we need to also recognize that, that it's, if you're going to err toward your mother, err on the side of grace. Amen? Err on the side of grace when you look at your mother's decisions. Because this mother here could have said, you know what? She could have given her child up when there wasn't a reason of death. She could have given her child up for reasons that weren't good. Right? She could have when she found out that the other mother took her baby, she could have said, good, because you know what? I'm so poor, I could never raise that child. I'm just going to get rid of it and give it to the other mother. Or, you know, she could have said, I'm embarrassed. I'm a prostitute. What are my friends and the people I know going to think in such and such a town that don't know what I'm doing, perhaps? They're going to know that I have a child, and they're going to know I'm not married. They're going to say I'm an adulteress or something. So I'm going to let her have it. Or she could have said, oh, this child could endanger my life, you know? Because in those days, adultery was punishable. It was a capital offense, punishable by death. She could be stoned to death. So this woman could have easily not have had the child. And if you feel like your mother hadn't been around for years, keep in mind, to over 2 million people a year choose not to have their child and they abort their children for those types of reasons I just mentioned. But your mother did carry you to term. Amen? She did have you. But typically and often, she's done even way uh, beyond that. Now, she, now, it's interesting because mothers have this incredible love that we're called to have in the Scripture. And I want you to turn to Titus chapter 2. Women, uh, This is uh, instructions to mothers. And and it's funny because when I look at this passage, I think when I look at this passage from time to time, when I'm looking at Titus and considering the roles of husbands and wives, and I'm always teaching uh, on parenting. I'm always teaching on uh, marriage. I'm always teaching because I'm always counseling. You know, it seems like this last month and a half, it's been 
a lot more counseling than normal. And I think that might be because things are tougher or what have you. But I'm always, and I always try to bring things about parenting to the pulpit and my messages and what have you. So we're always being challenged to be the parents uh, that we're called to be. But I think it's interesting in Titus 2, this scripture, when I look at it, it, it floors me because when you look at Titus chapter 2, let me get there. When you look at Titus chapter 2, he gives an instructions, and to me it's like, I guess it's because I've so used to seeing a mother's love, uh, it doesn't hit me that this needs to even be instructed sometimes. In Titus chapter 2, now, when you get there, look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, this is Titus, Paul writing to Titus to instruct him as how to, how to, how to run the church. And he's talking about in verse 3, I'm sorry, older women likewise are to be rev, uh, reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. So the older women, the elder, the women that are more mature in the Lord, so that they may encourage, verse 4, the young women to what? Love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. And I understand that the older, elderly or more mature women are to instruct these things. And there's some things that make sense to be pure, you know, not to gossip, different things that women and men can fall into. But, and even to love their husbands, because sometimes husbands can become very unlovable. And it can be very hard for a woman to love her husband. But to, she's instructed to tell, teach the younger women. And by the way, if you're a more mature woman in the Lord, you should be instructing the younger women and encourage them in the Lord. That's why when I mentioned, hey, we have a wedding coming up, you know, next Saturday, to be there for the support. Women that have been in the Lord for a few years, you see a younger woman coming to the fellowship, you should be getting to know them and encourage them in the Lord and loving them and encouraging them on how to relate to their children and teach them the scripture. And even if it's by just being their friend and being an example and just talking a little bit. Or it might be a, a, a formal Bible study. You say, hey, you want to start studying what it means to be a woman of God together? You know? These are things that need to be going on in our fellowship. And when those things are going on, guess what's not happening? Gossip and those kinds of things. So we need to be growing. And I, and I know a lot of the women who've been in the Lord a bit in this fellowship do do that, but all the women who've been in the Lord for some time should be engaged in that on some level. I really challenge you in that because that's how we mature as a fellowship. We play an important role. However, it's important to understand that women are here, the mothers are instructed also to love their children. That's the one that always throws me. I'm like, wow, because it's so women, mothers tend to just love their children. Even when their children, their children can be an ax murderer right? And they still love them and care for them so often. But it also shows me, guess what? That's there because a mother's love can also grow cold. It can happen. You know, there's a scripture in Isaiah 49. I, I love this passage, verse 15 and 16. Uh, it says, can a mother forget the child at her breast or fail to have compassion on the child that she has born? I Meaning it's so unlikely that she would. But then it goes on to say, even if she does, the Lord says, I will not forget you. I will not forget you, and I have engraven you on my hands. He's engraved our names on his hands. What God is saying there is that a mother's compassion is so powerful. Can she forget the child at her breast? Can she, uh, you know, uh, forget the child that she's born? Not likely, right? That's the rhetorical kind of answer or the answer to the rhetorical question. But then she might. But if she does, you know, I won't forget you. In other words, God's compassion is even more radical than in a loving mother's. And we have to keep this in mind. A mother receives their love because they're made in the image of God from God. Understand? That's so important to understand. That where do you think, sisters, those of you who are mothers, where do you think you've got this, received this love? It's come from God. And I think it's powerful because I've said over and over again, not just men. I don't know where people get the idea that men are made in the image of God because God so often is speak, spoken of in the masculine, uh, and women somehow are inferior and they aren't. The Bible says, male and female made he them. When it's, right there in early Genesis. 
you see. And it says that they're co-heirs to Christ and he died for all of us. And women are also reflections of the image of God. And I personally believe they reflect aspects of his image more so than men in certain ways and men more so than women in other ways. And that's how we complement one another. But one of the ways you most profoundly, if your mother, reflect God's image is that deep, intense, abiding, relentless kind of love that seeks to see a child restored when they fall. But if you're lacking that love, you say, wow, I'm going through a lot with my child right now, and I've been going through it for years, and this child is so ungrateful. You need to draw upon God's love. That's where it comes from in the first place. That agape, supernatural love from God. That's the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians, right? That's the kind of love you need to draw upon. And you need to ask the Lord to quicken your heart. And you need to remember that Jesus said in chapter 23, verse 37 of the Gospel of Matthew, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that slays those uh, who are sent to her and kills the prophets, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers together her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You see, Jesus compares his love. He compares a, a hen that gathers its chicks together to protect it as a reflection of his love. So you go to him because the Bible says God is love. And if you feel like you're lacking wisdom, where do you go? The king, the one that's greater than Solomon has come. Wow, if you're lacking love and you say, man, I want more love as a mother, who do you go to? The king, because guess what? He is love, amen? And when you ask anything in accordance with his will, he what? He gives it to you, he says. Is it his will that you love your children? Yes, he wants you to love your children intensely. Not to the point and not a distorted love where you, where you lie about who they are or you don't confront reality when something is wrong, but where you are full of love and you seek to do what's right, but you seek to have compassion on them, even as Solomon had compassion on these prostitutes. And wow, what an awesome love the Lord has. The third lesson, first lesson is the king's wisdom. The second lesson is a mother's love. Mother's love is so profound. And number three is God's grace. God's grace. And why I think this is so important is it blows me away from the very outset of this passage that there's two prostitutes standing before the king debating as to who child this is. Because prostitution was not accepted in Israel. They didn't have, they didn't allow by God's holy edict, temple prostitutes and things of that nature and typically, an adulteress would be stoned to death, just as an adulterer would be stoned to death. Yet here you see King Solomon having mercy upon these prostitutes. And that just blows me away. And that is another picture of Jesus, because Jesus, the one greater, behold, one greater than Solomon is here. He showed the same kind of mercy, didn't he? The Bible says he was a friend of sinners. The scriptures say he reached out to drunkards and tax gatherers and prostitutes, the people on the streets, to minister to them. When you look at the Apostle Paul's journeys, he did, not that he didn't go into any rural areas, but he went a lot of times from city to city to minister to people. And what's crazy about this is if you look at Jesus' genealogy, you look at the genealogy of Christ, you look at his ministry, there's some telltale signs that he had compassion on women who were really hurting and had failed morally. I mean, think of the woman caught in adultery, caught in the very act, and she was brought there by her accusers. Remember what happened there? They were ready to stone her to death, and they brought her to Jesus and asked him, Rabbi, we caught her in the very act. What should we do? What did Jesus do? He got on the ground. He began to write down different things. And as he wrote, and we don't know what he wrote for sure, but he looked at them and he said, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. And the Bible says that one by one, these men began leaving from the oldest to the youngest. And I think what Jesus may have been writing down was persons and places and dates of their own shortcomings. And the older were a little bit wiser and they realized, I got the message. And what happened is he looked at her and he said, woman, where are your accusers? And he said, 
you know, neither do I condemn you. Now, he didn't give her license to go on in her adultery, if in fact that's what had happened. He said, and I, it's implied that she was caught in adultery, because, but he did say this. He said, go and sin no more. Remember to the man, the paralytic that he healed, we talked about last week, go and sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. To her, he simply said, go and sin no more. He let her know that you've had mercy and grace. You've had an opportunity here, you know. Go and make well from it. So the moral equation was there. But he had mercy upon this woman caught in adultery. The law called for stoning. But he is the Lord of the law, amen. And he forgave her. In fact, he would later die on the cross for her sin and pay for that sin that she'd committed along with all of our sins. Also, you remember, he made a special trip as they were traveling, which was out of the way into Samaria, towards Samaria to the woman at the well. He had an appointment with her. The disciples went to get food, and he went to get water at the well. He was thirsting, but I believe in God's sovereignty. He set it up, and he asked her to draw from water. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but he revealed who he was to her. And he told her he knew that she had lived with five men. I'm sorry, was married to five men five times. And the sixth one, the man she was living with, she was not even married to. And then she said, I perceive you're a prophet. You know, it was a good guess, you know. And she, and she believed on him, and she trusted him, and he used her as an evangelist. She went into the town, came back out. And as she came back out, she brought many with her that believed on Jesus. He had mercy on an adulterous woman. He had mercy on this woman who was living with a man in fornication. He was, a, a, he was very merciful. Uh, he's our merciful king. So the third lesson is, mothers, you have God's grace there to avail yourself of. In fact, Jesus' genealogy blows me away. His genealogy really uh, trips me out because we see very, very unlikely people in his genealogy. In fact, in ancient genealogies, you didn't see, it was very, very rare if women's names were mentioned in ancient genealogies. Go through the ancient genealogies in the Bible. It's usually so-and-so was the son of 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 so-and-so and on and on. Yet when you go through the Gospel of Matthew, you find four different women in Jesus' genealogy. That's the first thing that blows me away about a genealogy in respect to who's in it. The second thing that blows me away when you look at Jesus' genealogy, it's not just women, but you see some Gentile women in his genealogy. You see Gentile women in his genealogy. That would be like anathema to many of the Jews. However, when you look at the Gentile women that were in his genealogy, they really couldn't argue with it. Interesting. The third thing that blows me away about Jesus' genealogy, number one, first is that there's women in it and was not typical of ancient genealogies. And number two, they were, some of them are Gentile women. And number three, almost every one of them was a woman of ill repute. That just, that of all the features, blows me away the most. In other words, think about it. The first woman mentioned in his genealogy is Tamar. Tamar rationalized sleeping so she could bring forth a child with Judah. Judah was her father-in-law. In, in her mind, she had good reason, but it was wrong. It was sinful. Yet, she is in Jesus' genealogy, and she's mentioned. It would have been very easy for Matthew not to mention that. After all, women aren't even mentioned in most genealogies. But he puts Tamar front and center. Wow. And Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He descended from that tribe named after Judah, who slept with Tamar. That blows me away. Then the next one that's mentioned is Rahab. Rahab was a what? A prostitute. Now she repented, thank God. And God had mercy upon her because she hid the spies and she was a woman of faith and she had heard about the mighty exploits the Israelites had, had done and she knew that, their, that Jericho was going to be destroyed because of their rebellion against God and their, their sin. It was like Sodom and Gomorrah almost there. But God had mercy on her and spared her. And not only Rahab, but the third one mentioned in Tamar, but Ruth. Ruth had, was a woman of integrity, but 
her lineage, we see she was a Moabitess. And without getting into that, we've studied that before. And as a Moabitess, she came from a people with a very wicked past who were not under God's blessing. Yet God took her, and Boaz was a kinsman redeemer, an incredible picture of Jesus, brought her in. Brought her in, had mercy upon her. And Boaz protected her and loved her. Yet she became part of Jesus' genealogy because guess what? Their child was who? Jesse. Jesse descended, I should say, from them. And then Jesse was the father of David. And Jesus is what? The son of David. Wow. Oh, and by the way, speaking of David, the fourth woman mentioned in the genealogy is Bathsheba. Bathsheba was a adulteress. She committed adultery with King David. Now, of course, he was the king, and he sent for her when her husband Uriah was gone, and he slept with her. She became pregnant. He tried to cover it up, and you know the story, many of you, but she, and she lost her child. She's another prostitute that lost her child at birth. That pretty sad story, but she became the wife of David after Uriah was killed, and she's the fourth woman in Jesus' genealogy. The woman at the well he ministered to, the woman caught in adultery he forgave. What are we seeing? He's a friend of sinners. We see that the Lord Jesus Christ reached out to those who had sinful lives who'd come far short of God's glory. What a thing to talk about at church. Hey, guess what? We are. We're Christians. The gospel is the good news. We are partakers ourselves of the good news. Amen? Good news means that God had mercy. Jesus became a friend of sinners, meaning he drew them to himself and offered them forgiveness so they could be forgiven, so their sins would be forgiven and their lives would be changed. And that's what happens, has happened to each of us. And guess what? Your mother may have been a prostitute or may have even committed adultery or did some really bad things, but guess what? Jesus had mercy on such people. And we should have mercy on our mothers, amen? And most of your mothers never did those types of things. How much more should you be quick to mercy on the little things that you may possibly hold against them? You should forgive your mom, number one, because she's your mom. Number two, because Jesus died for her sins. And number three, because your mother had to forgive a lot of things that you did growing up. Amen? So don't, in this Mother's Day, make sure you forgive and if there's the slightest thing that you hold against your mother and that you love her. Amen. And mothers, recognize that God longs to have grace upon you. Don't let this enemy condemn you if your heart is to seek him and you cry out to him and you say, have mercy on me. As King Solomon, the lesser than Jesus, had mercy on these prostitutes. How much more will King Jesus have mercy on you? Amen. So God's mercy is there because one greater, one greater than Jesus has come. Amen. One more compassionate than Jesus has come. I'm more than compassionate than Solomon has come. The Bible says the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. And the Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works as anyone should boast. Amen. And I end with this thought. What a beautiful picture Solomon and the story is of Jesus. Because this mother was, was willing to give up her only child that she loved so dearly to bring peace and save that child. Amen? And yet she received that child back to herself alive. Our God in heaven was willing to give his only son who didn't get sliced in two but was mutilated on a cross to die for all of us to bring peace to us, to give us eternal life. And then he received his son back to himself through the resurrection and ascension. Amen? That's the good news. The good news, mothers, is God has wisdom for you. Amen? He has love for you to meet the challenges that are ahead in a world that's increasingly becoming more and more loveless and less lovely. And number three, he has grace for you in time of need. He's waiting for you to come to him and to have mercy on you. Isn't that good news? That's good news for all of us. Amen. Give him glory. He is worthy. We love you, Lord. Praise God. Let us stand.
The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ, God sent his son to die for us. And Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The good news is that God indeed did send his son. We could start passing that out. God did send his son to die for us. And whether you're a mother or a father or a single person or a married person who has no children, the good news is for you too, amen, that Jesus died for our sins and that each one of us can have eternal life. So the best thing you can rejoice in today in Mother's Day is that God has given us mothers, but he's also given us his grace in his son, amen. Let's pray. You can pray with your eyes open if you're receiving the bread and the cup. Father, we come before you in your son's name, and we love you so much. Father, we thank you for blessing us with mothers, Father. The miracle, Father, of birth. And that little zygote, Father, that little baby just growing forth into a beautiful child and maturing, but becoming a child at the moment of conception, Father, and then maturing is such a miracle in itself, Lord, that we stand in awe of this whole birthing process and the whole gift of motherhood. And I thank you, Father, so much for mothers and that miracle and for sisters, Father, who may not be mothers of any of their own children here, but have motherly qualities that have made them mothers in other ways. I think of Leanne, Father, and, and how you've given her all these children to care for and all these little babies that have been born because of her work and all these young gals that she's been a mother to, Father, by reaching out to them and denying herself and extending her life, Father, to them. And I thank you, Father, for all the sisters in this fellowship who reflect your beauty and your love, Lord, to us to behold that dimension of who you are. We pray that you'd forgive each and every one of us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I pray, Father, if there's anybody here that's not forgiven, not saved because they haven't come to Jesus Christ yet, that they would recognize their sin and they'd simply confess it and say, King Jesus, have mercy on me. I have sinned. Give me a new life. I turn from my sin. I repent. I want to go and sin no more. Give me strength to do your will. Forgive me all of my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for joining us today at Blessed Hope Chapel. We hope you're edified by the service. Uh, our main hope and prayer for you is that you would know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said, I have come that you might have life more abundantly, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, enter the straight gate, for broad and spacious is the way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Our hope and prayer is that you'd be among those who find it, that you'd find eternal life in Jesus Christ. We thank you again for joining us. Have a beautiful week. God bless you. Till next time.